What's up, GRCon? There we go. Yeah, all right. So um, I've written on my pad that I'm supposed to say my name. So that shows you how nervous I am, uh, being in a room full of people that are most probably smarter than me, um, presenting on a, a project that I did. Um, so my name is Ben McCall. And uh, first, I want to get a little bit of admin out of the way. I need to issue a public apology to Jonathan Corgan. It wasn't personal. Uh, I didn't jam your mic on purpose. Uh, I didn't jam your mic on purpose. Uh, I do want to say that you know the administrators of the of the conference here did say that they could not be messed with. So I took that as a challenge. I don't. I, so my bad. Um, so uh, I have um, just a little bit of background. I am a uh, in my 20s, when I guess most people were going to college and getting ready to, you know, have jobs and be responsible, I was working in rock and roll as an audio engineer and uh, recording a lot of bands and drinking. So um, the uh, I moved on from there into the RF audio world in broadcast television, uh, doing a lot of work there. So I had a pretty heavy background in audio and then went into um, broadcast RF stuff. So. Um, that was my thing. I went back to school at 30 uh, to get an electrical engineering degree because I found a glass ceiling and wanted to move on and get more into the deep down stuff here. Uh-oh. I, I, I think there's some karmic retribution happening here. I'm being rickrolled. Am I supposed to dance? OK. And then there's that. So uh, anyway, I went back to school at 30. I gra I Thank All you. All right, thanks. Thanks, Skylar. Um, so I just graduated uh, back in May uh, with an undergrad degree in electrical engineering. Uh, and this was part of my senior design project. So. Um, all that said, uh, let's uh, get the show on the road. So uh, finding an active shooter with GNU Radio. Um, like I said, this was a senior design project at George Mason University in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, when we tackled this problem, we wanted to uh, come up with a creative way to address a problem that you know we're all familiar with. You see it in the news all the time. And, and this was just sort of uh, something that was a catalyst for us to get into some really cool DSP stuff and also some uh, you know acoustic phase array um, uh, uh, problems. And so uh, myself and a team of four other people uh, teamed up with two professors at Mason and came up with the Active Shooter Tactical Response Assistant which uh, spells Astra. So you can see that we tried really hard to get a cool acronym. Um, so some possible approaches and some of the barriers to these approaches were one way we could do uh, acoustic, you know, uh, uh, we could do acoustic um, detection was to do a TDOA network. Um, as many of you know, in, when doing TDOA, if you have a bunch of dumb omnidirectional nodes and you're trying to get a, you know, a time direction arrival off of that uh, sensor network, there's some timing issues. And uh, the hardware would be a little more simple than building a bunch of phase arrays. But we felt like uh, the timing issue was not something as challenging or, um, frankly, as attractive uh, as building out some uh, phase arrays. So the next thing would be to build one acoustic phase array that could you know, point a direction at a shooter um, if you know when they detected a gunshot and uh, a single phased array we found uh, was great for getting direction but not so much for distance. So we kind of combined the best of both worlds and did a network of direction finding arrays. So basically there was no node to node timing needed. Uh, each phased array has phase synchronous you know cabling from the sensors to the A to D converter. So we then have our phase synchronicity we need on a small platform, but then we can replicate that in multiple places and get reports back from all of these, uh, all of the phased arrays so that when they all project a vector back to a source, the intersection point would give us our, our distance or location, uh, provided we had some kind of GPS reporting at each node. So uh, I'll take you through a quick walkthrough. Basically, as I described, we have three uh, nodes that would encompass a shooter. The shooter would fire, and that report would be detected by the nodes. The nodes would then plot vectors back. Uh, thank you, LibreOffice, for showing my inaccuracies. Um, <laughs> hopefully, that arrow would point at the shooter, um, <laughs> and sometimes not. Uh, so then, uh, basically, that 
information would be reported back with a GPS location and a timestamp to a central data receiver, just a server running, and that would be reported over a wireless link. Uh, this would be a, this was kind of our, con our notional uh, design for what a, a user would see, uh, like a first responder would see on a terminal, which is like, hey, here's the shooter. So the approach that we had decided on um, was three simple steps. It was detect, determine, and locate. So detecting the gunshot, determine the direction of the gunshot, and then locate the, uh, the gunshot. And if the shooter is you know, somewhat stationary, we would then locate the shooter um, from that information. So the things that we wanted to do for detection, we decided to use match filtering. So uh, match filtering was uh, probably the most fun part of this, and I'll get to that later, but uh, collecting a bunch of match filters for gunshots was pretty cool. Um, so uh, the, uh, we actually got to you know, utilize some stuff that we learned in school, imagine that. Um, the, you know, we tested the FFT multiply operation versus convolutional FFT, or excuse me, convolutional um, you know, uh, match filtering. And as many of you know, you know, once N approaches, you know, exceeds like 64 taps, you get uh, a lot higher efficiency. So we actually could see a processor efficiency increase of about 30% when we ran the FFT, so that was kind of cool. Um, and for now, we chose fixed thresholding for the detection. So when the match filter output exceeded a certain threshold, that, that flags, hey, we got a gunshot, then we pass it on to the rest of the spatial uh, sensors. Um, in the array, and this, the, we buffer the samples, we go back and say, okay, we do some cross-correlation and uh, auto-correlation and extract the lags or the, the delays. Those delays can then be uh, used with some trig to determine the direction. This was uh, thanks to uh, Matthew Rudy, who did a paper at University of uh, uh, UPIT, and he did um, kind of a similar project to what we did, so I, I took some, some stuff here and put it together. So basically, a sound source approach is we buffer the input on the spatial microphones uh, so that if, in fact, we get a detection off of the detector mic, we can go back into the buffer and pull out the samples from this, the, uh, the spatial microphones there. And that's how we can get our, our uh, cross-correlation. This was a single node architecture. So um, basically, we had four omnidirectional microphones going into an analog to digital converter. Um, that was then uh, piped USB into our Linux CPU, which had GNU Radio running on it um, with you know, other just coding languages. Um, from the bank of match filters, like I said, if we got a detection, we would go into phase array calculation, and then GPS position on each node was being collected and packetized with that other information, sent through a wireless backhaul, and reported to a central reporting node. So, if you take the, this is the single node architecture and then replicate it on the left hand side three times, uh, you now have a network of direction finding arrays. And in the data receiver side, you can see that we would receive those packets, uh, run Java to KML scripts, just some simple stuff there, and uh, uh, pipe out a KML file that could auto update in Google Earth. So now we actually have a terminal window that your first responders can look at and see, you know, it's, it's a very simple terminal. It says, okay, here's where all the node locations are, and uh, if and when we do detect a gunshot, here's where the shooter is. And uh, so we, that was our, our, um, our task. So the physical array, which I'm sure many of you are curious about, we, um, this is what it looked like. Uh, it, total cost on this was about uh, maybe 400 bucks per array. We uh, ordered the microphones were just omnidirectional lob microphones like the one I'm talking into right now. Um, they're condenser microphones. They power off a 48 volt phantom power, which is in the, um, in the audio interface. We got a Tascam A to D converter. Uh, it's basically just a sound card, USB sound card, four inputs for 200 bucks. And so this was something interesting that I found was that, and something I knew from my audio background was that it, that phase synchronicity is, is one of the number one items for audio cards, because if you're recording four sound sources at one time, say a quartet or a drum kit or something like that, if the, if the streams are out of phase, then uh, there's, you get all kind of artifacts and you're, you have a bad quality interface. So you know, if you want four phase synchronous streams of RF into an interface, you will not be paying 200 bucks for that. And I think we all know that. So, um, this was a, it was a cool advantage to have. And like I said, we got the microphones off of Amazon, cut out some Delrin with a CNC machine, and uh, put them on top of a uh, standard lighting stand. And uh, now you've got an acoustic phased array. Um, so 
what's the GNU radio portion of this, right? Why GNU radio? Uh, it's easy, in air quotes. So it's mostly easy. Um, I, I, so I've, I've been working with GNU radio on the RF side for about five years, so I definitely had some background. I don't want to say that I just like jumped right in and it was it took off. But um, you know, we, when we started researching different ways to do this, we were like, OK, we'd find you know, pieces of Python code to do audio streaming, or you know, um, we'd find someone had developed an app that kind of did what we wanted to do. And you know, I was like, you know, this would be super easy to do in uh, GRC because the interface is so intuitive and it, you can see where each piece of your, your streaming is going, um, each, where each one of your signal streams is going. Uh, it's free. Uh, when we were doing a senior design on student budgets, that helped a lot. And it's supported. So uh, what I mean by that is that the message boards and the GNU Radio Forum and everyone there is like, they're so, so uh, responsive and supportive. And I have to say that it has been a real honor and, and just been so cool to be here and be walking past people who have, don't even know that they've answered my questions on the GNU Radio Forums. But it's been uh, really cool to be uh, here, part of that. But yeah, I just knew that we'd be able to get some support on that. So. Um, so that was why uh, GNU Radio seemed like a, a good option to do. Uh, we found that we could actually drag and drop the ALSA, the, like the audio sync um, block into GNU Radio, change the number of inputs to four instead of one, and you immediately have your phase synchronous inputs coming in from your audio interface. It was that easy. Um, and so from there, uh, I used some call outs here. I know it's a little busy, um, still probably at, you know, uh, one millibalant, but it's you know it's something to be said. Um, so we took the first input was our detector mic, as you saw, um, and that went into this custom cross correlation block that we wrote. Um, and uh, what that did was basically on a high flag, which a high flag would be generated through from the match filters. Uh, we would then go into a buffer, which we could determine this, the buffer window size, and it would run cross correlation and then determine what our angle was. The angle was then packaged up with some other information, GPS, timestamp, and sent along, and node number, and sent along to the, uh, the server there. So um, here you can see we actually have the match filters for like the AR-15, 9 millimeter, uh, a Beretta, like an M9, 357 Desert Eagle. So we actually had all the taps for these different gunshots. And these were collected like from recordings off the internet initially. And this is what we found when we ran it through. Um, so we, uh, the sensor input here, um, can you guys see my mouse? Yeah. OK. So this is uh, the audio of people murmuring and chattering, and then an AR-15 gunshot going off, and then a bunch of people screaming that I made in MATLAB um, by concatenating a bunch of audio files. I did not actually record that or cause that. Um, <laughs> So the, over here on the right, you can see these, all, all the colors correlate to, or you know, relate to different, um, uh, different firearm types. And so they're all overlaid here. You can see the sh sort of schmutz of different colors here. And the only one that flags high on the match filter output is the green, which correlates with the AR-15. So we found that it was actually very restrictive uh, when you use these, these uh, pre-recorded gunshots and extract taps from them that really we were wondering if this meant that we were going to have to categorize every firearm you know, that existed. Um, when we got to the field, it was a little different, but um, the, the initial you know, uh, progress here was good. So this is what, looked, what it looked like when we ran simulations on it. Um, we had the auto and cross correlations of each of the mics, and then we had a, an angle plot with the red line here. Um, basically, this was the, uh, you know, the direction of, of the, the shooter. And again, in GNU Radio, we were able to just simulate delays. We could just pop in a delay line on all three of them, do some calculation for how many samples equaled, uh, you know, how many, uh, you know, what spatial position, and get uh, be able to really do some awesome simulation stuff. Because as many of you know, you know, when you go out to the field and you start running off of battery power, and there's you know wind and rain and all kind of other mess, that things. Uh, our lofty goals for our field tests start to diminish very quickly. So being able to run things in a simulated environment were, were really awesome. So first thing we did is we tested with a speaker. So you can see that we have a sound source here. We were approved to do this at this particular location. And uh, you can see here that about 180 degrees back from the array, we had the sound source. And these were the, oh, excuse me. And then this was the setup itself. You have the node, the laptop, the umbrella, and my umbrella engineering, where I zip tied an umbrella to a lighting stand uh, to shade my laptop. These are the results. Uh, the raw audio streams are here. 
and then once they were cross-correlated, you can see that the peaks really were uh, stood out well. We have quite a few side peaks here, but nothing too, uh, too terrible, and we were able to get basically 180 degree vector plotted back to the source. Now we categorize match filters, and this was the fun part. So we got a bunch of guns. <laughs> we went to an outdoor shooting range, and we enlisted the help of a, uh, a US Army infantryman who came out and shot the guns for us. And I uh, you know, sighted in with my lensatic compass, uh, and sighted in the different angles that we were looking at, and we took shots from around the array. We would rotate the array, leave the shooter in a fixed position, and rotate the array around and, and test out what kind of uh, response we were getting. And we seemed to be getting good uh, results. And notice here, these are the results from the actual live fire. I will say that SNR is highly in our favor when, uh, when using gunshots. It's a great source. Uh, you got about 140 decibels of, of, of SNR. So you can see our side peaks went way down on the cross correlation here. And uh, so very clean signals, um, not a lot of noise. So then we went and uh, we wanted to do a, a multi-node test. So here you can see that we, we took all three nodes and you know, we got node one here, node two and three, and we SSH'd into node one because that's forward of the firing line and we don't go forward of the firing line. So we, took, uh, at, we would sit at node three and basically SSH into these and we used X windows, pulled up three GRC terminals uh, or GRC GUIs and we're able to start and stop the flow graph. We're able to record all the data we wanted and get stuff. And again, this speaks to like GRC is awesome. Um, it was in, invaluable to this, and we, we couldn't have done it without it. it. It just made things so much simpler. Like I said, we all know when you get in the field uh, and things are, are hectic and confusing and people are late and there's uh, you know, scheduling issues and, and stuff like that, the last thing you want to be thinking about is like just staring at one line of command and you, know, you accidentally typed in you know, one character wrong. It was really nice to have the visual there. Um, so uh, what did it look like when we all tested it? Um, I promise I have something that no one else has, and I'll show you why. So here's a video. Let's see if we got good audio here. So here you're going to see our user terminal with all three of the nodes being updated. System shooter, fire and ready. And then our army guy was Roll out for the day, so Tom Rondo showed up as our active shooter, <laughs> and so he's going to fire. And then you can see all three nodes report back, shoot vectors, and then there's our intersection point. Um, so the actual shooter location was where the orange pin was, and uh, you can see that the vectors with some lines of uh, error around them were pretty accurate um, to plotting back the source. So we located the shooter. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, we did repeat the experiment and did get the same results. <laughs> so it wasn't just like a one, a one, and, one and done, but uh, we actually collected a lot of data which we used for some things later on. Um, so these were our system error results. Uh, we used circular error of probability to calculate the radius around, the, to get, give us some of the error once we found the error in the angles plotted back from the nodes. We used circular error of probability to overlay that and determine like kind of a bubble where the shooter could be accurately uh, predicted. And that was about 2.15 uh, meter radius. So about 4.3 uh, um, meters of diameter, like a circle that you could find them. So this, would what, is, this is what a first responder would see. This was the end, end product here was uh, on the left side, you see the three nodes just kind of sitting there being updated by GPS with heartbeat messages and then on the right, if, if and when a shooter uh, fired a weapon, you could have a circle with vectors plotted right where they were. So uh, the last thing we did, and this is just kind of offhanded, when I mentioned earlier that we use fixed thresholding, uh, that's probably not suitable for most environments just to say, hey, we'll just choose this arbitrary number and hope that nothing else uh, causes the match filter to flag high over that. So we went in and used uh, most of the radar guys in here are gonna understand what CFAR is, uh, cell averaging, um, constant false alarm rate. It's basically a method where you could create an adaptive threshold so that when the match filter um, flagged high, you can see the green line. It's riding the noise, and as soon as there's an event, it peaks up and then scoops down and catches. A, and there's a, a threshold crossing occurs, and that's where you can say, "Oh, 
you know, we, we actually do have a, a threshold crossing, but it's adaptive to noise. So we wanted to at least take, you know, dip our toe into the real world and say, okay, obviously if these sensors were sitting up somewhere, we're not going to get a greenfield environment where it's, you know, 70 and sunny and nobody's talking and then all of a sudden a gunshot goes off. So um, we wanted to at least, you know, step into the real world a little bit there. So, um, yeah, this was the team. I just wanted to say thanks to, they couldn't be here, but uh, Rohini Shah, Pooja Patel, Joel Williams, and Aryan Tagiri, and also to Dr. Kenneth Hentz and Dr. Kathleen Wage from George Mason for helping make this happen. So, um, yeah, that's it. So I guess All we right, thank you, Ben. Do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, oh uh, yeah, if you go to him. Um, so, uh, they, did, did you um, refresh my memory? Uh, I think you might have said something about this in the beginning of the presentation. But um, was there? Um, did you look into doing like a time difference of arrival? You know, like GPS synchronized? Because I would think that with the speed of sound, um, you know, it, it's moving a lot slower than RF. So you might have a chance of doing something good with that. We did. Um, I think, you know, the. Yes, we did. That's a short answer. Yeah, we, we absolutely thought about TDOA. We didn't know if the timing issues were going to uh, come in and bite us. And I think it was because, you know, I did some early tests um, in, in the beginning where I, I and I kind of just wanted to build a phase array, just to be honest. Um, that's That was sort of what it was. This was an undergrad senior design project, and uh, we had, I started early on it, and we had a calendar year to finish the project. So. Hearing what I'd heard about timing issues in TDOA systems and kind of how that's uh, very much on the cusp of what people are doing today, I did not assume that five undergrad students could maybe make any kind of notable dent in that problem, um, whereas this seemed like a little bit more feasible deal because we could completely abandon timing between nodes if we just used you know phase synchronous um, phase rates. But yeah, it's a good question and definitely a direction we could have gone. Absolutely, yeah, and we, you're right. We could, we could absolutely use the detector mics as also just you know uh, the the single output of the match filter and and see if we could synchronize them that way. No, definitely. I mean, uh, what do we say? Future work, <laughs> which means I'm never going to get to it. Um, but yeah, the, it, no, no, it definitely would be uh, a legitimate thing to to consider. So, we have another one. So definitely, um, very good work. Thank you. Um, there, there, there could be uh, another future work uh, in terms of. Uh, Maybe in, in a an um, urban, uh, urban, yeah, uh, yeah, an urban setting, um, you know, with more there's more echoes and multipath and all that stuff. So yeah, sure, so definitely. Uh, I'm sure the FBI will will figure out how to how to arrange something like that. Sure, yeah, and there's definitely competitive systems in place right now where you know other people have done this. Um, you know, there's like the Raytheon boomerang from the defense standpoint, which is a single phased array that can, you know, plot back a vector in an estimated distance. We're just going to start setting up. Right yeah, now. sure. And uh, then there's also the, um, there's also the shot spotter system, which is a TDOA system, uh, which obviously involves a lot of infrastructure calibration of the, um, like of the line, like the delay lines. They have to do, you know, a you know, reflectometer on all the lines so that they can get, um, so that they can get the timing measurements. Uh, yeah, so. Oh, so Tyler. Have, have, you, have you considered making it where the first responder can, or on the terminal, you can hear the sound that triggered it, so you can verify that it's a gunshot and not a false alarm as well? Uh, I, I had not considered that. Um, I think that's a good idea. That, that, would, that would definitely be, uh, be a common sense approach. And it would make sense. We wanted the, uh, the backhaul from each of the nodes to be as lightweight as possible, just so that we could run it over any network that existed. So that was one reason we didn't want to stream any kind of you know, uh, samples or anything like that. But I mean, not a bad idea. It could, it could certainly be done. Have Sir? Considered just three microphones instead of four? Have we considered three microphones instead of four? I had not considered that. And it, it makes sense. You mean just use one, one or all of them? Right, just use one. So you could, and I, I can't work it out right now in my head. The reason was we used the central microphone as the kind of as the um, as the reference point for each one of the spatial mics, and it, I'm sure it could be done. We even started to go down a route where we were going to maybe cross correlate between, you know, one and two 
as well as the, the detector mic, but we, we did never considered it anything beyond that. That's a good point, though. Question over here. Um, did you end up testing it with a firearm that you didn't have a match filter for? That's a great question. Uh, we did not. Um, so what we ended up finding, I, I think I alluded to this earlier, was that some of the match filters, they were very, we felt like we were maybe too constricted. And then when we went to the field, we found out that it was really kind of a rifle is a rifle, um, at least from the standpoint that we took. And we didn't do any smoothing or any kind of real deep, deep investigation into the match filter taps. So um, I can tell you that the output from having mistakenly run the wrong match filter while we were testing another firearm, um, I believe that a handgun did not trigger a rifle match filter. I think, that, did that answer your question? What about rapid fire? Was so this is a first shot detection system. As soon as the first shot goes off, uh, it's, you know, and I will say that the window of what we choose for the taps, if you had a repeating, uh, if you had a repeating, like a machine gun or something like that, um, it would probably still be within the window of the taps. But the, uh, for a single shot, uh, just multiple shots, it would just catch the first shot and then the system stops, which also goes back to the reflection question that we had from the urban environment, sir. Thousands? Repeat the question. Uh, the question was how many taps on the filters? And it was, uh, I think it was several thousand taps. We wanted to get a very accurate fingerprint. So that was, that was how we did it. Uh, one of the things that was interesting was that a, a supersonic round will make will break the sound barrier, and then you'll ha hear the explosion. So you'll actually see two impulses right next to each other, and so a way to discern between uh, you know a supersonic rifle and a say like a subsonic nine millimeter handgun was to include all of that range with the supersonic um, rounds. And we fixed the video. Do we have any other questions? No? Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks.